Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, again, thank you very much for being with us today. And as you know, we have been sort of following up with with an issue that, that has been long overdue here in the city of Portland, here in the state of Oregon, in terms of what it takes, if you will, to do business uh, here in the state of Oregon, if in fact you're an African American. And especially in Africa, especially African Americans who are well educated, uh, uh, involved, if you will, in community, uh, established in community, uh, have uh, demonstrated, if you will, their skills from various positions that they've had within the state, for that matter, from a natural perspective, from local perspective. Uh, and, and I'm talking about Baruti Artery. And uh, if you didn't have the opportunity to see that first show, I would suggest very strongly that you do see that. You'll see the address on the screen, and you can go back to that first show. But what we're going to do, we're going to continue on, if you will, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with Baruti in terms of his description of what it takes to do business, you know, here within the state of Oregon and, and with a small minority of African Americans, it's a very difficult one. So we're learning something too as we go for that. This is not in all due respect an anti, if you will, for African Americans. It's just, in, it's just in all due respect, we're all within the same situation aspect of it. But we need to learn. We need to learn that we, we've got to, in some way, shape, or form, be somewhat together. We have to, because we're a small minority. And so we just can't do business like we've been doing in, in the past, if you will. And this is why I'm saying this is what this show is all about. This is what Baruli brings to the table. We want to thank him very, very much for having the courage, if you will, to come here and share this with you across the board, and to Oregonians for that matter. You know, we've always been very positive uh, uh, from a majority community about our small minority, if you will, of African Americans. But trust me, there's been some hurt within that arena. So we may have to change our way of doing business from a majority standpoint, okay? And again, like I said, I'll just cite some of the things that I've cited um, last time around, but, but just to give you a feel, a little, a little better feel of, of Baruti here, uh, I think I'm, I, I'm talking about the awards and things of that nature. Spirit of Portland Award, Public Health Hero Award, Living Legend Award, Men of the Decade, 100 Stars Award, 2011 Black History Month Honoree Award of Excellence, uh, Walk the Grand, 2011 Walk Grand Marshal, you know, he was my, my drum major, if you will, uh, this last time around in Black History Month, you know what I mean? I want to thank him for being a part of that, and that's one of the reasons why we're interviewing him. Uh, as far as in engagement includes in past community and civic engagement, board chair of the Urban League of Portland, a well-known operation here within the Oregon, within Oregon African American Alliance, co-chair. Uh, Co-founder of the Cherry Merchants uh, Partners in Diversity, Portland Trailblazers Community Advisory Board, uh, Vice Chair of the Northeast Community Development Corporation, Portland Bit. You know, I, I just on, on and on and on. Been featured in all sorts. I, I did my my homework too, and I vetted it, trying to make sure that he was he was my man. That I did this before, uh, from the standpoint of, of picking him up, if you will, as my my honoree, mm -hmm. if you will, for John Reed for for for, for, for uh, Black History Month and whatever. And here's one that, he was here, he was profiled in the diversity manual, recognition to, in, to inherent value of every person from Pro Providence Health System, you know, a very large organization. This is a national publication that he was, mm -hmm. he was featured in. And, I mean, it, it, it just goes on and on and on as far as the accolades are concerned and whatever. And then all of a sudden one day, here this man was going to take on a post, was going to take on a post with the mayor of the city of Port Charlie Hill, in an area that this community has been very, very bothered with many, many times over. And I'm talking about police, I'm talking about uh, the whole issue with gang issues and things of that nature, just a reinforcement of the negatives within uh, our community as it relates to our youth, if you will, especially the African-American male. And then here, here's Charlie's going to pick up an African-American male to lead that charge. The Justice Department has some very interesting concerns, if you will, about relationship with the Portland Police Department. This man was going to be at the chair right there at the head at, at that table, and it was going to be something that was going to be of benefit to all Oregonians, and especially here in the Portland metropolitan area, the African-American male. Then all of a sudden, up jumped the situation with the uh, uh, with, with, with this announcement about the fact that he had harassed, if you will, a sitting Multnomah County Commissioner in Loretta Smith. And the next thing you know, the gentleman hadn't even gone on the job one day. And all of a sudden, here he is. Um, uh, he was being basically being chastised and wasn't actually fired, if you will. He just selected himself to basically say, well, okay, fine. He respected the mayor and just left, left the office. But just behind the mere fact of calling a person beautiful. 
Mm. And, uh, and you know, it just went on and on and on. But anyway, like I would suggest to you, go back to that last issue if, you, if you're new to the program and check that out. But what we're going to do, we're going to continue on. He had some other things to say, and he used a word there that I thought was very interesting and made, made a lot of sense. And for those of you who don't understand the translation of it, I'm sure you will. He, he used the word political drive-by. I mean, you know, it has some significance. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to continue with the political drive-by. Uh, I'm going to introduce Rudy. How you doing? Great, Bruce. Doing yeah. well. Thank yeah. you again for having me on the show. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I always just have to acknowledge you because you were the one that gave me this opportunity to come and really tell the truth about But before the we get into that, I want to talk about Grandpa. We talked about the Joe last time around. Yeah. I know that yeah. you've been kind of relaxing yourself. You've been visiting family. Yes. You've been going back and forth between California and here and whatever. Mm -hmm. I know you're a very, very family-oriented yes. type of person. Well, what about Grand? What about Papa? Well, great. Thanks, thanks for asking, <laughs> what about Bruce. Because as you know, I spent a lot of time with my four grandsons. Yes, and uh, we had a great day yesterday. Good. And uh, my oldest grandson turned 14 years old. So this great. is a shout out to Isaac. Uh, happy birthday to you, because I know he'll be watching this. Good. And I'm really excited about the grandkids. And when I left the mayor's office, that was one of the things I said I would do. Good. And and a lot of folks don't know the whole story, but I'll just share this with you real mm -hmm. quick. Uh, uh, in addition to the political situation that I was dealing with at the mm -hmm. time, uh, I had gone through three deaths of close friends. I mm -hmm. lost a close friend in July last year uh, after this incident happened in June. Uh, he was 58 years old, dropped dead of a heart attack. Wow. Had another friend who died in August that was 55 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she died of a heart attack. In September, Labor Day, I get a phone call. One of my close high school classmates who was actually uh, someone who played football for the University of Oregon, played mm -hmm. for the NFL and was in California running for the California Assembly, wow. he didn't wake up on Labor Day. Oh, and so when I think about that, and then at the same time, I found out that my one and only son was uh, going on kidney dialysis because he has to have a kidney transplant. Uh, so when I factored in all of that into the situation, I decided where did I need to spend my time? I, and I've been very fortunate the last few months. I've spent a lot of time with my family yeah, here yeah, in California, yeah, 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 the yeah, grandkids, yeah. And, and I appreciate you inquiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how, how about Joe? How's he are. doing? Young? understand the last time yeah is he doing okay now joe is doing good he's good. he's been a little bit under the weather but uh he's tough you know he's 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 bouncing back okay. he's joe bouncing you better back. come on by and, and get a get a get a bowl of that gumbo down at norma's kitchen you do now okay yeah yeah <laughs> okay. and i'll throw that in for norma's kitchen too uh, check right, it out right. but uh let's, let's I, continue on okay bruce uh, as on. you know I, I i i said a lot in the last show for those of you who didn't get a chance to see it i talked about political drive-bys and i'm going to get right into that and just before i do though i have to do my tradition i have yes. to give my acknowledgement give my shout outs and then i'll get right into it because that's okay. what we do yes, and as when i came on the show i said before last time i make no apologies because i ain't trying to explain myself yes. to folks who don't understand i just want to be real and direct and truthful and honest. And so, Bruce, I do. I thank you. I thank Portland uh, Community Media for this opportunity. I am glad that we have an opportunity in this community outside of the mass media to come and tell our story, uh, to get the facts out, because you. you've heard me uh, share with you what I think about the mass media. The mass media here in Portland from the newspapers, uh, it's a lot of follow the leader. Uh, if one tabloid reports something, everyone else chimes on. If that tabloid is five degrees, degrees off by the time it gets told two months later they're 50 degrees off of the story so I, so I thank you for that I also want to thank all people in the community that have given me so much feedback since the last show. I've had so many people who said, thank you for speaking up. Thank you for uh, sharing the truth. And a lot of what I said, again, in our community, it's no surprise to anybody. <laughs> Folks are saying, oh, yeah, we know what you're talking about. But I also the reason I said I really want to get this out and I really want to kind of frame this whole issue of political drive bys mm -hmm. today, because I realize, uh, as I tell my oldest grandson who plays basketball, that if you look at life in four quarters, uh, I'm in the fourth quarter right now. Yes. Uh, the Bible says uh, three scores in 10, and that would mean 70 years and you a blessed man. If you get to 80 and over, I mean, you in overtime at that point <laughs> is the way I look at it. So I realized that I'm in the fourth quarter and I got to play the fourth quarter a little bit different than I did the first, second and third quarter. And right now, as I said before, I ain't working for nobody. I'm speaking for myself and I just got a lot to share. And I say that because just in this past week, I've had four different depths uh, of people who are close to me. And I want to, again, do a shout out to the Probasco family, 
Pastor Robert Fabasco passed away, and uh, he was the father of my uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to the Davison family. Uh, they lost their uh, patriarch, Floyd uh, Davison. Uh, he passed away. A mentor of mine, Lou Merrick, who was from L.A., worked for the Chancellor University of Oregon when I was back in the 70s and a student. Uh, he passed away. And uh, good brother Richard Greer lost his sister. This is all mm. in the past week. Wow, so man. when we look at life, you know, yeah. we've got to be real yeah. about where we are. And, and in my case, as you know, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. And so I don't I ain't playing. I'm serious about the stuff I have to say, and I want to get it out there just in case between now and the next 30 days I get hit by a truck. No, no, I want to know. I got it all out there. I, I want to know that I, I had did. it all set. And so so then I want to say quickly, shout outs to my people around the country who have been following this story, who have emailed, contact me on Facebook, uh, who have been sharing the YouTube video of this. Uh, my people back in Indianapolis by way of Chicago, my brothers down in Vegas, all my own family in Texas, Georgia, Michigan, who I've heard from. My Aunt Bebe, when I talked to her recently, she name? told me to be sure to tell y'all, she's not 85, she's only 83. So, Aunt Bebe, when you see this, I did make that correction. I want you to know that. And I want to give a shout out to the cast of the gospel musical, Let's Talk Church. Because as some people know that I've been a part of that cast for a number of years. We've traveled. It's a Christian gospel show uh, written by a former high school classmate mm. of mine. But now, because of what's going on here, they just had a show yesterday. Mm. And so, and they've got another one. But I told them, I can't come. I can't participate. Because I'm on, I'm on the job right now. i got some business to handle on this end. But I will be back, and I will be joining the cast. In fact, I have a new character that I'm <laughs> going to come up with. And this is someone who is a former professional wrestler who cuts off his jerry curl and then decides he's going to work in the church. But the problem is he's too big on self-promotion and <laughs> too big of blustering and all of that. So, so we're going to weave that into the script. That's going to be our next character. Okay. So now let me get into the drive-by. Um, and, 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 and the major reason I feel it's important for us to have this discussion is because uh, the young people who are in this community are coming up, are looking at some of the political climate, the business climate, and feeling that they are running up against gatekeepers. Uh, they're running against people who are self-serving. And, and I've attended two forums, intergenerational forums, involving young African Americans in this community, professional folks who have raised this same issue. What do they have to do to deal with the gatekeepers? Mm -hmm. When I spoke up, I've had many say, thank you. Finally, someone from your generation is speaking up and exposing what we're seeing and what mm -hmm. we're experiencing just as we come into the mm -hmm. city. So just to recap real quick, and, and, and I use the term political drive-by because all of us, no matter who we are, whatever situation we come into, we bring our background, our knowledge, our life experience, and everything else we have into that situation. And how we interpret that, how we internalize it, how we respond is based on all of that. And so when I look at uh, the positions that I've had from a business, a political standpoint, I also relate back to where I grew up and things I saw happen in that community and lessons that I learned. And so, as I said before, I know what a drive-by is because I grew up in Compton and growing up in Compton, I said before, uh, drive-by normally is a group of cowards who get together and try to take somebody out under the cover of darkness and then pretend that they don't know who was involved. And so I recounted last time, I'm not going to go into all the details of what happened uh, in the incident, what happened that night, uh, because we've already been there. And as I've said before, my point is to talk about the people who were involved in the political drive-by. And this community is small. The African-American community is even smaller. And a lot of information has come to me. And when I did my assessment of dealing with the various deaths I mentioned, dealing with the illnesses that I'm dealing with, and retiring and trying to take care of a lot of stuff, I said, I just can't let this go. I said, I could not live with myself if I sit back and let's see another brother or sister find themselves victimized by some of these same clowns and buffoons. I just couldn't do it. And so one, I mentioned before, David Austin, who is the public information officer for Multnomah County, uh, I refer to him as Stephen, the house Negro in the movie Django. Mm. And, and again, if you haven't seen Django, you should see it. It's, it's a very good movie. Uh, and, but Stephen was played by Samuel Jackson 
in that movie. And in the last show, I mistakenly said when I was on a roll, he was played by Samuel Adams. Oh, okay. And so I, I caught that later. But it was Samuel Jackson. Steven, look at the character. He is the biggest house Negro you want to find. And uh, here in Portland, as I said, I've seen David, his, his articles as a writer, attacking the black community, attacking black folks. And he's really good at attacking black males. And, and, and I see where he is a person who certainly was one of the first persons that Loretta talked to about what to do when I called her beautiful and David went out and started contacting his friends in the media and they took a story and took, uh, took this that was, was nothing and made, made something out of it. So David Austin, uh, uh, I don't have nothing else to say. I say, former folks, Oregonian, or he worked former Oregonian. Oregonian reporter, right. and I don't even know how he got hired at Multnomah County. I don't think there was any African Americans on the interview panel because hmm. I think if folks from the community had been on there, this detached Negro would not have gotten that job. <laughs> and I think they need to check him out and see how well he's serving because people, these white folks, these liberal white folks, run around act like he's some kind of authority on Northeast Portland, some authority on the African American community, and he ain't. Mm -hmm. OK, the second one I talked about. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time rehashing everything mm -hmm. I went over before. Mm -hmm. But the second person whose name came up in the in, in the political drive by was Roy J. Harris. And why did he come up? And I said before, when this situation happened, all of a sudden Roy J. is in the Oregonian newspaper putting me on blast about what I should have did and what I shouldn't have done. Never called me, never talked to me before he talked to the media and putting me on blast. And I was taken back as to why would he want to put me on blast. Was he there? He was not at the event. He had no connection to it. The only connection I see is that he is a close advisor to Loretta Smith. And I have to assume he was advising her that attacking me publicly uh, for this was uh, something that he, uh, he decided to participate in. <laughs> so I consider him another person who was part of the political drive-by. And also was very clear, why do I suspect Roy J was part of this because I said before that in the positions that I have held, I have been accountable for hundreds of millions of dollars with various public agencies and working in the corporate community and all of that. And one of the things I've done is that I've been a good steward and a good public servant uh, with those resources. And there are certain people, especially some African Americans, who don't feel that they have to be held accountable to the same standard of other folks. Hmm. And so folks have, again, uh, encouraged me to go downtown and talk to the powers that be and speak truth to power. And I've done that in corporate boardrooms and mm -hmm. city halls, political arena. I, I, I ain't scared to do that. That ain't mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. But when I turn to some of them saying black folks and tell them they got to get their stuff together, they yeah. got to step up, they got to be accountable, mm -hmm. then they want to get mad and get attitude. So yeah, I've told Roy J on more than one occasion. I'm not supporting anything that he does that's only supporting him. Mm -hmm. So little did I know that I became a target. So there's been a number of, of situations where he has uh, taken opportunities to take shots at me and this was one he took a shot at me. You know, why did he not, from the time I joined the mayor's staff in February 2013 until I left there in October of 2013, he never contacted me. He never touched base with me. He never reached out. And here he is serving as president of the National, black, uh, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives here in Portland. He's the local president of that group. One, I don't even know how he got elected. It's my understanding they're normally sworn officers who hold that position. But he was able to do that. And I think it's just all part of, of the game. It's part of the illusion that has been created. Mm. And, and what I've seen is that in this case, there's an illusion that's been created out there. And this is for the young people out there. Young folks, as you're building your career, there's something I thought about. And when in the private sector, we used to call it sizzle and steak. Yeah. And we said when we worked in the private sector, and I'm talking about when I was doing sales and marketing for a Fortune 500 company, we said there are some folks out there, they ain't nothing but sizzle. Yeah. You see them, and it's a whole lot of smoke, and it's a whole lot, and they look good, smell good, but when you get right down to it, there's no substance. And there's other folks who bring you the steak. And Roy J has been nothing but a bunch of sizzle. He goes out, and I just say, where's the steak? Where's the steak? And when I look at the contrast as to why I, I, I have the attitudes I have about this is because I worked my way through college, came out of Compton High, uh, and went to college, graduated with a dual major, went into Boise Cascade when there were no other people of color working in the sales force nationally. I spent 15 years working, clawing my way up the corporate ladder, and I learned the lessons. I learned how to do business. 
I learned how to stand up on my own two feet. I'd, I'd learned from people who were Harvard MBAs, Stanford MBAs, University of Chicago MBAs, who took me under their wing, took me how to learn me uh, how to run profit centers, how to manage a bottom line, know what return on investment is. So for the 15 years that I worked with Boise, even though I lived in this community, I wasn't really in the community. I wasn't looking for no handouts. I wasn't working any social programs mm -hmm. or anything else. I was there earning a living, taking care of my family, traveling all over the world. And after 15 years, when I went to work at Boise, I'm sorry, I went to work at Coast Industries after leaving Boise Cascade, I carried those same principles in the coast. And we took a business that was almost bankrupt and turned it around with the same type of accountability and holding people accountable using those same principles. And even the years I was at Coast, we didn't get engaged in Portland to the same degree because we realized that back in the 80s, that because of what was going on at that time uh, due to the economic climate, we had to go national. So we took a local business and we turned it into a national corporation that worked in 13 different states. And I was able to go out and work on contracts with the Department of Defense, and the last big contract was with NASA down in New Orleans. We were there before Hurricane Katrina, post-Hurricane Katrina, in there negotiating multi-million dollar contracts because I had done it with Boise Cascade. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying that this is the essence, this is the stake, that if you're out there, you have to work, you have to prepare yourself, you have to continue to be educating yourself, you have to learn. And you have to go to school, you have to get the experience there so that you don't find yourself in the position where all of a sudden you feel that for whatever reasons that you are inadequate, insecure, that you got to lie, you got to cheat and you got to steal. Mm -hmm. That somebody and when I look at this and from a business standpoint, inside Boise Cascade, the people told me my mentor, Pete Norrie, he said, he said, I don't care what you do. Don't do anything illegal, immoral or unethical mm -hmm. and get the job done. And we ran one of the most profitable reason in markets. So all that to say, this is about sizzle and steak. And all that to say, when I see Roy, what I see is a whole lot of sizzle. I don't see a whole lot of steak. I think black folks in this community have just tolerated him and all the games he had been playing for this year. And, 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 and the white folks continue to accept him like he's some kind of leader. Now, tell you, the illusion, Bruce. Now, you heard my resume. Now, if I wanted to pump myself up bigger than life, all I got to do is run out and get me a bunch of websites, get out and yeah. plant some stories, get out and grease some palms with some local media to run some good stories on me and make me look good, run out and take some pictures with some of these uh, gullible white folks who, who want to be down and mm -hmm. put them on my website, put them out there, look at all my friends, look at all the press I'm getting and all that. But if someday, sometime, somebody got to say, Bullshit. Where's the state? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, for the yeah, system. Yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah, I said I wasn't going to cuss. I'm no, sorry. No, that's the first time. That's the first time. That's last time. So anyway, I didn't mean to get all off on, on Roy like no, that, but okay. I just need to that's get okay. that out yeah. because I got to move on to the next person. And so David Austin and Roy, I talked about them last time. I got still more to say about them, too, when the time comes. But the next person who was part of this drive by. So here, I want you guys to see this because because if it doesn't make sense, it is nonsense. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that has been said about all this, it has just been pure nonsense. And if you read what's been written in the newspaper, uh, in the media, it's nonsense. So let me just bring this back to you. So number one, you've got David Austin out here running, talking to the people, planning stories, trying to give them a scoop. And let me tell you what happened. And the people run out and the white media takes it and they run with it and blow it out. And then one media tries to compete against the next one. So they add a little bit more sensationalized to change a word or two. And this story keeps getting bigger and bigger. And then you get some other clowns want to come like Roy J come and he got to say something, put himself out there. And Roy J of all people, when I think about it, now here's somebody going to criticize me for calling somebody beautiful. And one of his most famous quotes is, I may give up pork, but I ain't never given up white women. Now, what kind of <laughs> stuff is that? And this is something for y'all folks out there who are watching this later around the country, just to give you an idea. This brother, he just cut off his Jerry Curl last year. Yeah, but he going to run around, make a statement like that, and then want to put me on blast. So you got David Austin. He starts telling the story. The media picks it up. It goes out there. You get somebody like Roy J. He chimes in. And everybody wondering, what's going on? What did Baruti do? And I'm sitting here baffled that... Mm -hmm where this thing is gone. It just doesn't make sense. And it was nonsense. And then the next person who chimed in was Nick Fish, current sitting city commissioner, Nick Fish. And, and as I Portland thought about city it, Council, right? Portland City Council, mm -hmm. Nick Fish, who is running for office right now. And I just have to be honest with folks about Nick. 
all of, I read the paper and they said, oh, yeah, Baruti should have got more time off. Oh, Baruti should have been fired. Or whatever he said it was totally out of line and way off, way off base. And here's why. Here's, here's from my perspective. Right, here's okay. why. Because number one, with Nick Fish, when he decided to run for office, I supported his campaign. I held a fundraiser for him in my home. Uh, he's had dinner in my home. I invited him to church. We've been to church together. When after he got elected as city council person, uh, I did some consulting work for the Bureau of Housing. When the Housing Bureau and PDC merged, I worked with him on that. Even after the consulting contract ended, he continued to call me for advice and all of that. And, and people know, if you ask me, I'm going to tell you, I'm straight up. I'm straight up. But I've never worked any place or worked with anybody. If you ask me for my advice and you don't take it, I'm not going to keep offering up my advice. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to tell you why I believe Nick Fish got into the middle of this. Because when I talk with Nick about issues that he felt were important, we talked about the fair housing issue and that survey that was done that went sideways and, and that was just bogus. And I gave Nick my advice. My advice was, Nick, it's time for you to take some names and kick some ass. Mm -hmm. and Nick didn't do that. Nick tried to do what was most politically expedient, in my opinion, and the situation wasn't handled well. When the Housing Department and the Portland Development Commission merged with the Bureau of Housing and Community Development, and I went to support Nick in trying to make that happen, I feel the people who came over from PDC were not treated fair. There was not fair treatment done in the way that that process was handled. And I talked with Nick about it. I was very vocal and very much upfront about it. When I looked at the outreach being done by the Bureau of Housing Community Development in North Northeast Portland, I, I, was, I was very surprised. I went to a meeting in Northeast Portland after I had complained to Commissioner Fish that I didn't feel they were doing adequate outreach in Northeast Portland. Mm -hmm. And the person there representing the, the, the Bureau was a summer intern who came to a meeting to talk about issues around gentrification. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't have picked, I think, a worse person. He was a summer intern, didn't know the history. He walked in with a prepared text that somebody had gave him. He got up and read the text to black folks sitting there in the audience who have lived this history. And, and on top of that, he had a British accent. I mean, he couldn't have been more hmm. disconnected from our community. And I go back to Nick and tell Nick, and again, I felt Nick falls into that category of these pseudo-liberal folks who are going to either be patronizing, mm -hmm. per paternalistic, or mm -hmm. dismissive. And I felt a lot of these issues around African America were dismissive. I found myself, while Nick was over the Bureau of Housing and over the Bureau of Parks, getting engaged with issues involving African American employees because the employees were calling me, asking me for assistance in dealing with issues where they felt they were being treated unfair. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't being paid to do that. I jumped in to try to help the folks in the Parks Bureau, help with the African Americans in the Housing Bureau. And the one thing that really was the final straw with Nick for me was uh, when I worked at Oregon Housing Community Services uh, and I took over that uh, department under former Governor Barbara Roberts, which, by the way, I, I thought about this, too, uh, in my career. You talk about I worked for number of women. I worked for Janet Wright, who was the marketing manager at Boise Cascade. I worked for Barbara Roberts, who was governor. I worked for Felicia Trader, who was executive director of PDC. I worked mm -hmm. for Sister Marie uh, when I was at Providence Health and Services. And, uh, and then I was hired by Gail Shibley. So I've had a great working relationship uh, with a lot of different people. But the thing I want to go back to say, but what happened with Nick, though, when I was at Oregon Housing, one of the things I learned, and, and uh, some folks in the community know this, while we're complaining about lack of affordable housing now, a lot of the affordable housing that does exist in Portland, it happened or initially started during my tenure as director of Oregon Housing Community Services. You know, I even had people give me awards because I was trying to be low key. I wasn't out there, you know, promoting myself what we were doing, but some people recognized the value of those investments and in putting that housing in. And so when we, and so with Nick Fish, the thing that bothered me was that one person I met at Oregon Housing, name is Comey Calivar. Comey Calivar is an African brother who I found out very quickly at the state, he was a tax credit administrator, mm -hmm. administrator for the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. When I was director of state housing, I realized that there were only three or four 
black state housing directors in the entire country. Hmm. And I happen to be one of those. And I also realized in the entire country, there were only three or four black folks who were tax credit administrators because these were considered the gold nuggets in the development community. Hmm. And so the federal tax program who put these tax credits out there, it created a very sophisticated financing vehicle that would enable you to leverage bond financing and other stuff in order to build affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And we issued over $100 million a year in bonds, so I had to learn high finance. And Comey helped me to understand the relationship with tax credits and bond financing, and therefore a lot of the housing you see that has been built was a result of that. When I went to work at the Portland Development Commission, the first person I hired was Comey Calabar. He was so bright, he was so smart. He stayed there. He stayed there until the merger with PDC and the Bureau of Housing Community Services. And much to my chagrin and to the shock of the white folks who worked in the banking industry and the development community, uh, Comey was let go. He was let go. And folks said, why? And the more I looked into this, I saw he too was a victim of a drive-by. Wow. That he was a person who was in that bureau, became one of the highest ranking persons of color. He was speaking up for those organizations who were serving the North Northeast community. He was speaking up about serving people of color and he became a sacrificial lamb. Who and directed that point down? At that time, it was Margaret Van Vliet was the director. Nick Fish was a commissioner in charge. And so, and Nick was intimately involved in this. And this is why I stopped communication because Nick started to intimate to people that I was part of the decision to let Comey go. And I was totally shocked by that. So I told Nick, no, no, I'm through. Don't even call me for anything. But then I go to work in the mayor's office. And this is the part. I'm going to say this about Nick real quick. I go work in the mayor's office in the first week there. Nick, oh, we got to go to dinner. We got to go to dinner. And so, and we go to dinner. We have this conversation. And his whole conversation is he wants to keep the park bureau and the housing bureau in his portfolio. And again, Baruti <laughs> being his candid self, I told Nick straight up in February 2013, no. I'm not going to support, I said, if and when the mayor asked me, I'm not going to support you keeping the Parks Bureau or the Housing Bureau just based on my experience and what I've seen. I'm just that honest, just that candid. You know, in Portland, you know, that's not how people act. People are more uh, Portland polite and people will say one thing and mean something else or say one thing and do something else. Well, I'm not that way. I'm straight up. So I told Nick in February. And so then as we go throughout the year, we get in through the budget. And when the housing bureaus uh, uh, was assigned, it was in May. And I remember getting a, a call from Nick saying, Baruti, can you come down? I want to talk to you. I went down, met with him at 9 o'clock. He was meeting with the mayor at 10 o'clock to find out which bureaus he might get. And the whole purpose of the call was to say, Baruti, do you know? Do you know what's going on? <laughs> you know, this is somebody, he's a real political animal. And I, and I knew, but it wasn't my position to tell him right. what bureaus he was going to get. He went and met with the mayor at 10 o'clock. Nick Fish never called me again. He didn't get the housing bureau. He didn't get the parks bureau. I don't know if anything I said had any bearing on the mayor's decision or not. I said, but he didn't get those bureaus. And so the next thing I know is that he stopped calling, stopped speaking to me. And he was, and I don't know, again, does it make sense? I could be wrong. I didn't hear anything. So the next thing I hear anything, Nick's got anything to say about me. He putting me on blast in the Oregonian saying Baruti didn't get enough time off. Baruti should have been fired. I'm going, where is this coming from? Oh, this is political payback. This is political drive retribution. By. This is a political drive by, folks. This is what it is. You know, again, if you're going to be a truth teller here, you better be looking over your shoulder because some folks, they don't want to hear that. So, so that's where Nick Fish figures into this. And uh, as I said, he's earned the name. Uh, they call him Nick Jellyfish Fish, yes. and he's Nick Jellyfish. That's all I can say. I, I, I think he's spineless, and I'm very disappointed in the way that uh, he's handled himself. And, and, and I have to tell you, I'm the one to introduce him to Roy J. Harris. And I'll say <laughs> oh, that. I introduced him to Roy J. And that's part of the reason I believe he's tied to this is because when I introduced him to Roy J. during the time that we were dealing with the Gresham School District superintendent over a termination of the first black African-American principal. Roy J. got involved. Nick was the attorney, the civil rights attorney involved. And all of us were involved to help get a successful outcome for that person. But one of the things I will say, I believe Nick came away from that fearing that Roy J. may one day turn on him. Because Roy J. said then, he said, he said, I've got this newspaper on a leash. I got this reporter on a leash. And can if we need to go plan a story, huh. I can get a story planned. Wow. And he wanted to plan a story on Gretchen Schuette, 
who was the superintendent of Gresham School District, who last I heard was president of Clackamas Community College, she never knew this. And I said, no, I'm not going to be part of that. Mm -hmm. But it always stayed in my mind that Roy said he's got these folks on a leash. Mm -hmm. And when I got my phone call, it was the same people he said he had on a leash. Oh, on okay. a leash. On a leash, folks. Take it, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Political Drive-By. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome again, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest. Again, my guest is Baruti Archery, and we're going to get right back into political drive-by. Baruti. Yes, sir. Thank Come you. On, sir. Thank you. Uh, you can tell I get a little passionate that's when okay. I talk about this. That's, okay. that's, that's, that's just me. Okay. And, and the other thing that's so funny is that uh, some folks who saw the last show, yes. they said, God, I didn't know Baruti was so direct. I didn't know yes. he was so passionate. What you see here, this is where I've always been. When I'm in the boardroom, when I'm with my family, I have passion. I'm for real. I'm a straight shooter. And so and folks who have known me 30-some years will tell you that. I have friends that live here in Portland right now that grew up with me in my little neighborhood who say the same thing. Well, this so, is very so, so this is just me. You know, say, say how you expect? How am I going to run some multi-million dollar organization as being Mr. Nice Guy? Yes, you know, roll right. over. Oh. You know, you got to be ready to stand up for exactly. yourself. Exactly. And so I've been very blessed to have those opportunities. Who so, else do you think might be involved? Okay, so here's the folks. So again, so here's the rundown. Here's the posse. David Austin, Roy J. Harris, Nick Fish, all of them out there taking shots, taking shots, and saying what they're saying because they feel that they can get away with it. You know, mm -hmm. they've done this. This has happened to other people, and other folks have been hurt, mm -hmm. and other folks have uh, been afraid because of, 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 of what might be said in the press or fate fade that there may be some other consequences they haven't been ready to speak up but i, I just ain't cut from that mode and now and and this is the this is the other one that really caught me by surprise during the time that all of this was happening that uh again i called loretta beautiful and this whole machinery went into action and all these people speaking up and the news cameras all over town the cameras and as i said they compare me to mel gibson paula dean Jeez. uh and michael richards and all these folks with these bad <laughs> reputations and say it impacted my grandkids my son my my auntie four generations in my family i think it was so callous it was so insensitive in this community to uh jeopardize anyone's reputation yeah yeah just by what a few people say your yeah. reputation gets damaged because a few people yeah. have an issue or they have an axe to grind with yeah. you. And then they get the support from, from these, again, liberal white folks, uh, gullible white folks. But the other person who really, really uh, was, I was disappointed in was Margaret Carter. Margaret Carter. And, and as I thought about it... Former the, state senator. Former state senator, former Another state representative, time. former president of the Urban League. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Margaret Carter. And what Margaret did, and then I'll tell you why I think she did this, Margaret was a person, when all this went down, she went around gathering signatures of mostly, I believe, uh, a lot of other women calling for me to be fired. And the letter was sent into the mayor, and there might have been maybe 15, 20 women that signed this letter. Most of those women were people who, who, who hold elected office or have held elected office. And this, too, was another... Uh, a situation where I said, well, where is this coming from? Why is Margaret in this? Why is Margaret She's showing... She's retired. Didn't she retired? And, and I, going up hers and... 
I don't know. I don't know. But I can yeah. tell you this. I, that part, I, I really okay, don't all know. Right, all right, okay. But I will tell you this, though. I tell you what I do know. I said, as I say, what I have to say hasn't already been reported. Okay, Number good. one, no. it's been reported about how ineffective she is as an administrator, as a manager. It's been reported in some folks' memoirs, Margaret being very two-faced. And I have to just, you know, I, I was going to save this for my memoirs, but I just got to come out and say it, that in this state, in this community, I personally have not dealt with any elected official that I have found to be more two-faced and a bigger liar than Margaret Carter. Hmm. And I've never put her on blast. Hmm. I've never gone out and put her on blast. Hmm. I've had my dealings, my interactions, and I've seen this. And uh, uh, but, but in contrast, she has had an axe to grind with me because she's one of the persons who I called on the carpet and wanted to hold her accountable hmm. for the position that she was in. This is what it was, Bruce. I was asked to serve on the, on the board of the Urban League of Portland when they were going through their financial crisis. At the time, I was the deputy director of the Portland Development Commission, had never served on the Urban League board because I was more involved in organizations I felt that were really more grassroots and never had an interest because I didn't, wasn't looking for just an organization to put on my resume. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking for places I could serve. But when the Urban League went through its crisis, many of the board members uh, fled. And they left the board, and Margaret, and I, to her credit, she stepped up and took over the board, started raising money, started turning it around, started recruiting new board members, and came to me, asked me to be on the board. And I tried very hard not to be on the board. And I said, well, if I do this, then I don't want to have a office. I don't want to be an officer. She said, okay. A year later, I was asked to be the chair of the Urban League board as we're going through the turnaround. And I agreed to be the chair. But what I didn't know Part of this request was trying to put me in a position so I could go along with some of the mismanagement going on within the Urban League. Hmm. And, and I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but I will just say this, that as chair of the Urban League and chair of the executive committee, along with me was a person who's very well known in this community, Charles Wilhoyt, who has uh, served in many capacities around this city. Barb West, the former president of Kaiser Permanente, served on the executive committee with me. Uh, and we would try to meet with Margaret to have executive committee meetings to talk about the lack of administrative skills we see going on in running the Urban League. That there were things not getting done in terms of personnel, mm -hmm. things not getting done in, in terms of just getting the paperwork done, and it just wasn't getting done. And when we approached Margaret and said, well, Margaret, you know, well, she had just retired, I believe, from PCC. She had a retirement coming in. She was still uh, uh, serving as a legislator. And so she was getting some income. And it just happened to be the year there were more special sessions that summer than any other summer. She was constantly running back and forth to Salem. And all of a sudden, some of our major fundraisers started telling me as board chair that we don't want to give money to the Urban League because we feel like all we're doing is funding Margaret's political career. Mm. And they said that she's doing more legislatively than she is with the Urban League. And so I found myself as chair of the board trying to turn this organization around and figuring out how do I manage this with Margaret. The executive committee, uh, we had meetings. Margaret would not show. She wouldn't call. She was unresponsive. And it was kind of like a snub, like in your face. And like I was supposed to go along. So I decided myself, I said, you know, I'm not going to be part of this. And I finally got Margaret to sit down and I said to her, Margaret, I'm going to resign from the Urban League board. I can no longer keep my name on this organization and go out trying to raise money, knowing what I know that's not happening, that should be happening. Hmm. And offered to help, but she didn't want any help. So long story short, the next board meeting, we op I open up the meeting and Margaret, without any notice, just announced I'm resigning, announced her resignation. The entire board was shocked. <laughs> the only people who really knew what was going on were members of the executive committee because we had chose not to share it with the board at that point because we were in the turnaround mode. So when Margaret resigned, everybody was shocked. We went into executive session. We had the staff leave the room. I took the time and laid out to the entire board who were various professionals with various business backgrounds what was going on and what we had been dealing with. And, uh, and it was predicted that the board was going to leave because Margaret was no longer there. One person left the board, 
And that one person happened to be the lady who was Margaret's publicist before she joined the board and still her publicist. They left the board. And so we went on. But ever since that happened, Margaret has had an ax to grind because the way she flavored this, and this is where the lion part that comes in. Not long after that, I go to a National Urban League conference because the National Urban League is in the ball and they're trying to decide whether the Portland Urban League is going to survive or whether it's going to die. Mm -hmm. I show up at National Urban League conference along with Charles Wilhoy and I'm being attacked by the National Urban League member because Margaret then went and told the National Urban League I forced her out of her job mm -hmm. because I want her job. And that was so much a shock. The Urban League was struggling, and I was making well over $100,000 in the position that I had. But she planted that lie, and people who didn't know me, when I showed up at the National Conference, I was bombarded by that. I come back to this community, and the lie is being spread that I'm forcing Margaret out. I did this to her. And it was all going back to, see, understand this. Hmm. It's about competence. It's about competence and having the ability to perform versus being somewhat unprepared and not able to deliver, so therefore you got to lie, steal, and cheat. And mm. so by her not being prepared, instead of accepting the help of somebody saying, let us help you, let us, let us kind of uh, support you to get some of this stuff done, it's easier to turn around, lie, and steal, and plant some stories on mm. folks. So ever since that happened, she's been out here, you know, kicking me, and I've just ignored it. Mm. You know, and I think when I look back for hindsight, when I said, what conditions produce themselves to make some of these Negroes feel like they could do a drive-by on me? And I think this was the first one, because Margaret, when she was running around lying on me, I, I just couldn't even deal with it because I was so frustrated by it. And finally, I had to go to a fellow board member, Robert Stoll, who's an attorney here in town. And I told him, I said, if Margaret continues to go around lying on me, I'm just going to have to come clean and tell the press and everybody else in this community exactly why she's no longer at the Urban League, because mm. it was about incompetence. Mm. And she stopped lying on me to the press and publicly, but every time I see her, she's out there just, you know, taking shots at me. In fact, one of the incidents that Loretta said she was upset, I called her beautiful at, but nobody else took it that way. Who was sitting next to her? Margaret Carter was sitting there next to her. And I'm sitting there emceeing this van and doing my thing. And what I see, Margaret Carter all frowned up in there, just whispering Loretta's ear, and all that. Now, what is that? It's a, give me a break. Give me a break. I can't believe. And then and then to run around and then skin and grin. I say two-faced because she'll skin and grin in your face and then turn around mm -hmm. and then lie on you and all that. And as I said, I'm not the first person to say this. I'm just telling you my part, what my experience is. And so with Margaret Carter, because when I told people, people say, well, how did she get involved in this? Why is she organizing a letter writing? campaign a letter writing campaign it was a letter writing campaign to the mayor and not only did she do this she went out and they say got 15 20 people to sign this and this is and this sticks in my craw too because um and i believe people truly believe and trusted margaret and that if she came to them with a legitimate issue mm -hmm. that they should support it and some folks just jumped on without researching it mm -hmm. and i have had one person who signed that letter who told me that she didn't even know what she was signing or what she was getting into when she made the commitment. And so, uh, but, but here's the part that really baffles me is that in all the positions that I've had, I've supervised hundreds of people, if not thousands, and I've had dozens, if not hundreds of people come to me telling me they've been victim of racism. They've been harassed. And, and a lot of cases, African-Americans coming to me to say, oh, God, let me tell you what they did to me. And so the first thing I've learned that I've got to do is get the facts. You mm -hmm. know, anybody can say yeah. somebody is a racist. Anybody yeah. can charge racism. So throughout my career, I would always get the facts. Before I took a position, mm -hmm. before I took any action, I'd want to find out what was going on. And especially if it was a case that someone was charging racism yeah. against yeah. someone who I knew yeah. and someone I've worked with, someone yeah. I would ask some questions. And this is, this is the part, and this is why it makes me feel like, again, that it's the plantation of Portlandia, because the way some of this stuff falls in place. This is no reason why hmm. white folks prefer to be here, because they can do what they want, and they don't get questioned and challenged. So all of a sudden, Margaret jumps up and says, oh, we got to get Baruti fired. Let me get this letter started. And she runs out to all uh, these women, and, and I think a lot of them, good people, good intentions, but gullible, and they didn't even take the time to ask the question mm -hmm. about what are the facts, what are the circumstances. Some of the women who signed that letter are in elected office now. Some of them are running for elected offices. Some of them I've worked with for years, and not one called to say, Baruti, can you tell us what not happened? One. Baruti, not one, but they signed this letter. And so that's the part for me, when I start looking at the nonsense 
the nonsense of this and how this thing swells. And all it takes is one or two house Negroes to spur this on and to pump something up and to throw it out there. And so I feel that the whole sisterhood response, or the feminist response was totally inappropriate. It was an overreaction. And the women who signed that letter calling for my termination, you really need to sit down, take a look at yourself and ask, what would you do if this situation came up again? Because if I had one time accused someone of being a racist based on what someone told me and mm -hmm. found out that wasn't the case, I sure would be very apologetic and I would adjust my behavior accordingly. But in this case, you know, people do drive by on black folks and they think they can get away with it and nothing happens because we get devalued. Yeah. We're dehumanized. Yeah. We're not supposed to have the same emotions. It doesn't yeah. supposed to affect us the same. And so I want to uh, I have two things I want to leave you with two yeah. things I think is really yeah. important, yeah. because when I was looking at this Carter G. Woodson, who's the father of black history. And people ask him, well, why did you start black history? And he said, because it's important that our people have knowledge, that people have wisdom, and that we learn the lessons from the past. He said, that's very important, because if we don't learn the lessons, we continue to repeat that behavior. And I love what our Jewish brethren, when they say, never again. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and sometimes I think for us, we're saying, here we go again, mm -hmm. here we go again, here we go again. And until we learn some very specific lessons, we're going to keep going, here we go again. And so Carter G. Woodson, he said this, and this is in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro. This is what he said. He said, if you teach the Negro that he has accomplished as much good as any other race, he will aspire to equality and justice without regards to race. Such an effort would upset the program of the oppressor in Africa and in America. Therefore, play up the Negro then, his crimes and his shortcomings. Hmm. And what are we doing? I mean, this is Carter G. Woodson in the early 1900s. And so we go through these periods of, uh, of, of slavery and Jim Crowism and civil rights and all this and say, where are we at? And then it's unfortunate that as a people, because what I believe is the post-traumatic uh, effects of slavery, and Dr. Joy Leary speaks to that very well, we got black folks and white folks still acting like they own the plantation. Yeah. So you get folks who are house Negroes, and then you get some folks who get put in charge or put themselves in charge of, 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 of black folks, and they think they're the overseers. Mm -hmm. And if you saw the movie, 12 Years a Slave, everybody has probably seen that by now. It won the Best Picture Award. And I sit there, I watch that picture, and Solomon Northup, and what he was going through, the first thing they did when he was stolen into slavery, they, he tried to tell them who he was. They beat him down. They said, no, you a slave. You a slave. So the first thing the oppressor wants to do is to tell you who and what you are. Going to beat you down. They want to define you and tell you what you are and want you to accept that. And he fought that. He fought that. And it was the same thing when I told the story about Kunta Kinte uh, trying to keep his name and not be Toby because he was trying to define himself. And so, and when he got beat down, he called himself Toby. And same thing with... Uh, with uh, Solomon Northup, he finally had to accept the name of Flack, and he went through that. And I watched him uh, as he was trying to get the word out that, hey, I'm a free man. I'm a free man. I am not a slave. I am not a slave. And he tried to send word this way. He tried to send this word this way. And no matter what he did, he kept getting oppressed and repressed. He watched as some other blacks, they were made overseers over some of the other blacks to help keep them in line, you know, to help beat them down. And so, and the thing with Solomon North though, is that he kept until he got the word out. And that's why I said, Solomon North should have had Portland community media. So he could have got his word out that he was a free man, that he was not a slave, but he didn't have that. So he had to, he had to live with that. But, but the one thing that I think is really important too, that as we go forward, the thing that I've learned is uh, one quote. It was by Claude McKay, Man Child in the Promised Land. And, and this is how we stop repeating history. We start studying, we start getting wisdom, mm -hmm. we get education, we read. Mm -hmm. Because as you said so eloquently last month, that what we were celebrating was American Black History Month. Mm -hmm. Black history is part of American history. Right. And I believe right here in this community now, when we talk about people like Harriet Tubman and so Sir Turner Truth, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Malcolm X, and, and Angela Davis, uh, all these folks, 
We've got those same people right, right here in our right own here. community. Exactly. They need to be developed. Exactly. They need to learn how to speak up. And so I say to all the young folks out there, you are living black history. And what you do and say is going to be part of the history. So it doesn't matter that you're living in the city that is the number one preferred city by white people. It doesn't matter that you're living in the city that is called White Landia, and they're doing a documentary on it because it's White Landia. It doesn't matter that Conan O'Brien said on TV that the word Portland means too many white people. They say, you got to stand up and fight your battle yeah. wherever you are and stand up for truth, stand up for justice, stand up for accountability. And like what Claude McKay said in his book, Man's Child in the Promised Land, this has always stayed with me. He said, like men, we will face the cowardly, murderous pack with our backs against the wall. We may be dying, but we're going to be fighting back. And that's where I'm coming from. Rudy. This has been this has been just great. I mean, I'm sure that the viewing audience really appreciate uh, uh, your your statements and your your knowledge and your insight, and hopefully they take it very serious. And it's for all of us for that. Matter. Yes, sir. And we really appreciate that. This. this is not a negative of that matter. Like I said, we need we gotta we gotta do something different, if you will. And that's what we're talking about. Now, before we get there, by the way, would you mind uh, coming back again? To, uh, and I still got a lot more to share. Well, I, I have what, a lot more. I thought I could do this all in one hour. No. Now we finished the second. I still yes. got some more. Well, well we will do this. If, okay. this Thank okay you. With I, I appreciate it. Well, look, we got about two more minutes, but I'd like to see, give, give, if you can give us sort of an update uh, from this Justice Department situation. You have, oh. sorry, give us a little update. We got about yeah. a minute and a half here. Okay. So. I'll, I'll, I'll just be real quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I reported last time that some of the information that came to me when I was doing my investigation of this drive-by uh political drive-by that I experienced, a lot of people came to me with information uh, about certain people that bordered on being uh, illegal. And I'm not a, a, a law enforcement officer, but what they gave me, I took the position as a taxpayer, as a citizen, to turn that over to the Justice Department. And the Justice Department has said, if there are other people out there who want to share information, you should contact the U.S. Treasury Department, the Nonprofit Fraud Investigation Unit, because even since the last show, people are still coming to me with information and stories about what's happening and things like that. I'm not trying to be the conduit. I've served it up. I've given it to the proper authorities. They're pursuing it. They're going to investigate it. And and hopefully truth, justice, and accountability will be carried out. And this was specifically in regards to Roy J. Right? This was specifically in regards to Roy J. Mm -hmm. and, and a couple of the nonprofits that he has his name associated with. And the other thing I would, and I said this before, is that, mm -hmm. is that you got to look at the people who stand around these people with questionable characters, the people who are close to them. But this was about Roy J. Harris. And you can go online. Look at the Oregon Secretary of State. Look at how many nonprofits Roy J. Harris has his name connected to. And, and so people are telling me me stuff and what I can see I have no reason to discount it or disbelieve it okay but hey look thank you very much my friend we appreciate it and we're gonna see you next time around thank you sir I, and appreciate it. I got a little quick note what about that uh, your grandson that said can, can you call can you call mama beautiful oh his mother is beautiful and he calls her beautiful all the time now all right, yeah good. thank you very much my friend and we hope to see you again next time around. thank you okay appreciate good. it again folks thank you very much I'll see you next week when we'll probably maybe, we'll probably be looking at maybe the candidates that are running for district two if you will mm -hmm. Again, that's another very interesting subject. So join me next week, okay? I'll see you again. Have a good one. As Roy J. Not Roy J. Tell me about that. <laughs> As uh, I'm thinking about my.